Uh, Catherine Perez Estelano is going to moderate this session. She has um, been one of our friends for a long time on our advisory board, uh, was on the California High Speed Rail Authority board, longtime urbanist, uh, rail expert. I won't read your official bio, I'm just making it up, but um, please welcome Catherine Perez Estelano. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to uh, have so many folks interested in kind of what we're doing here, and particularly this upcoming panel, transit oriented development and station uh, architecture is something that's near and dear, which is why Andy said, hey, why don't you moderate this, because it'll be fun to have the Q&A and ask a lot of questions as we uh, round up a, a long and, and important discussion. So we are going to start uh, with Transbay. Uh, Joint Powers Authority in San Francisco, very exciting project. I had the opportunity to tour it and go deep into a, I think it was, I think it was 70 feet down, and walk in the uh, the belly of that uh, tunnel, and it, it's awesome. And the opportunity that Transbay brings to San Francisco is transformative. So we have with us uh, Scott Bull. He is the Legislative Affairs and Community Outreach Manager. Uh, for the Transbay Joint Powers Authority, and in his role, um, he's done a number of things uh, on the Hill and uh, worked extensively with the Transbay Transit Center, and so he is going to give us an overview and an update on the project. TOD is such an important part of the overall transportation kind of ecosystem, so I hope that we'd have a good conversation after that. So, Scott, your turn. <clears throat> Thank you, Catherine. Our uh, executive director, Mark Zabana, was supposed to be here, and he sends his apologies. He got summoned uh, to a meeting at City Hall uh, and did not have input on the date and time, uh, which I'm sure some of you can relate to, uh, to having that experience. Uh, the project that Mark and I work on started back in 1999. There was uh, a measure that went before the voters in San Francisco, Proposition H, uh, and it was a vote to determine whether the old Transbay Terminal should be rebuilt and transformed from a bus-only facility into a bus and rail facility, uh, and whether or not Caltrain should then be extended into that, city, uh, into that new facility in the heart of downtown. Uh, that measure passed overwhelmingly, uh, passed uh, by 69 to 31, uh, so quite a, quite a strong uh, uh, seal of approval from the voters in San Francisco. That led to the creation of the organization that I work for. It's called the Transbay Joint Powers Authority. Uh, it was formed in 2001, and uh, we're responsible for the design, construction, and uh, operation and maintenance uh, of this new uh, transit facility. And uh, the, it's a multimodal transit hub. So what we're doing is bringing together a total of 11 different transit systems under one roof, uh, eight different bus lines from around uh, the entire Bay Area region. You see the reach of some of our systems on this slide. We will have a connection to BART, which is our regional subway system. Uh, the far eastern uh, end of the transit center is just over a block from uh, the Embarcadero BART stop. Uh, and then we will eventually be the northern terminus uh, for both Caltrain and, uh, relevant to this discussion, uh, high-speed rail from, uh, from Southern California. And so here you see, uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with San Francisco, you can get a sense of where we're located, but uh, the point here is uh, we're right in the heart of downtown, uh, obviously in a, a very dense urban area, just about a block south of Market Street, a few blocks up from the Ferry Building. Uh, so uh, this, is, this illustrates why we believe this project is going to be such a strong example of the concept of transit-oriented development, where you have all of those accessible, affordable transit systems in very close proximity to the region's jobs center, as well as uh, new housing, 11 acres of new open space, retail, uh, all of the amenities of a new neighborhood that's emerging around this transit center. So the project is divided into two construction phases. Um, all of the renderings uh, that you see in this presentation, those are all phase one. Phase one is construction of the facility itself. And we are on track to substantially complete this building in December of this year. Uh, so this is what it's going to look like by the end of the year. A couple of things that 
stand out on this, uh, on this rendering, uh, the five and a half acre rooftop park. Uh, as you can imagine, that's quite a bit of open space for a dense urban area like this. Um, that five and a half acres alone is going to more than double the amount of open space that currently exists in the South of Market neighborhood in San Francisco. In total, in the area surrounding the transit center, it's referred to as the transit center district plan area, there's going to be 11 acres of new open space. A couple other things that stand out on this rendering, you see the three buildings, and, and uh, often when I give this presentation I have a pointer, but I think they're pretty easy to make out. The three tallest buildings on this slide are the three buildings that are going to have a direct pedestrian bridge connection to the rooftop park of the transit center. Two of them are, are well underway and um, uh, nearing completion by the end of 2017. One's uh, referred to as Salesforce Tower. Uh, the other is 181 Fremont. The third uh, kind of grayed out building, that's a parcel we just sold last uh, June. So uh, it's still being designed, but it is going to be a third, a third, a third. It's a third hotel, a third residential, uh, and a third uh, commercial. Uh, the other thing I, I want to point out on this slide is in the uh, uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a very small cable-stayed bridge. Uh, that is a bus ramp that connects directly from the bus deck level of the transit center to the Bay Bridge. The Bay Bridge leads to the East Bay, uh, which uh, is Oakland, Berkeley, major population ce uh, centers. About 60% of our bus traffic comes from the East Bay. So for all of that East Bay bus traffic, those buses are going to come in and out of the transit center without ever touching city streets, without adding uh, to downtown congestion in, uh, in San Francisco. So here you see a cross-section of uh, what the transit center will look like by the end of the year. Uh, the top level, the rooftop park that I mentioned, just below that is the bus deck level that uh, has the direct connection to the Bay Bridge. And then below that you see what we refer to as the Grand Hall. The Grand Hall is the uh, main entry point into the facility and in the Grand Hall we're going to have about 103,000 square feet of uh, retail that will be part of this, uh, this first phase. Uh, just below the Grand Hall, you see our two underground levels. Uh, we, we received a $400 million ARA grant uh, back in 2010, Recovery Act grant, that allowed us to build out this train box, uh, build the shell, uh, as part of phase one. Um, and then it'll be fitted out as part of phase two, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the first of the two underground levels is referred to as the lower concourse. And in the lower concourse, we're going to have another 30 to 35,000 uh, square feet of retail. So in total, we're looking at about 130,000 square feet of retail, uh, which is very relevant to the discussion about transit-oriented development. To give you some context for that amount, uh, again, for those of you familiar with San Francisco, the ferry building in San Francisco has about 65,000 square feet, and uh, Grand Central Terminal in New York has about 135,000 square feet. So it's roughly uh, equivalent to Grand Central Terminal, and that retail is a major amenity for this new neighborhood that's forming around the transit center for all of the residential and commercial neighbors that we're going to have. Um, also in the lower concourse, you'll have things like baggage claim, ticketing, waiting areas for Caltrain and high-speed rail, and then the, the, the lower level, the bottom level, are uh, three platforms and six tracks, uh, again, to bring in both Caltrain and high-speed rail. So very quickly, a couple of renderings of what the park will eventually look like. Here you can see there's a, a walking, jogging trail that'll make a half-mile loop uh, around the perimeter. Uh, here you see on the far west end of the facility, we're going to have a, an amphitheater, uh, which seats about 800 people. So this is an area where we can have events, uh, concerts, uh, performances. On the other side of the stage that you see here is a restaurant uh, that'll be uh, on the rooftop park. So this illustrates some of the revenue uh, generating opportunities that we have to help cover our annual operations and maintenance costs for the facility. We are at the very end of the process to bring on an asset manager. The asset manager will be responsible for operating the facility, but also these revenue generating uh, uh, opportunities like leasing out the retail events, advertising, sponsorship, all of which again are helping us with our annual O&M costs. Uh, so here you see uh, uh, the four block span of the rooftop park. Uh, there's a series of 13 different gardens that we'll have um, throughout, uh, throughout the park. In the center we'll have a children's playground and uh, in this rendering off to the right you see an area where we'll have a cafe. Uh, this is um, 
an, one of the, the key design features of the transit center, this light column, but it's also one of our key sustainability features. So it's, it's part of how we're on track to achieve a lead gold rating for the facility because this light column goes all the way to the underground rail levels and brings light all the way to the underground rail levels. So it offsets our daylight electricity usage. Uh, here you see an example of the message boards that we'll have throughout the facility. This is the main message board in the Grand Hall, but uh, throughout the transit center we'll have kiosks with information on ticketing, wayfinding, uh, the amenities of the transit center, retail events, uh, so forth. Uh, here you see another one of the major design elements of the transit center. This is roughly 60% in place. If uh, any of you are in San Francisco anytime soon, this awning that goes around the entire perimeter should be completed in uh, sometime in June. The other thing that you can see on this rendering is um, a portion of Natoma Street. Natoma Street runs along the southern edge of the transit center. We're gonna have a 400 foot section of Natoma that's gonna be pedestrian only. And so the idea is that um, that creates a nice entryway into that 103,000 square feet of retail that we'll have in phase one. It also um, creates a nice promenade up to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which was just renovated last year. So this is where we're at with our construction timeline. We started uh, phase one way back in 2010. Uh, in August of 2010, uh, we broke ground, started with demolition of the old Transbay Terminal, had a very long period of excavation, which we finished in early 2014. That allowed us to finish all of the foundation work by the end of 2014. We spent 2015 putting the steel in place, and last year we finished pouring all the concrete, uh, made progress uh, with the bus ramp, which is gonna be completed towards the end of April and uh, are on track for substantial completion uh, by December of, uh, of this year. So one of the things that we like to emphasize, um, particularly when we're uh, at conferences like this or, or especially when we're in DC, is when you make an investment of this magnitude, I think this is especially relevant to high-speed rail. I know Caltrain has a similar map uh, related to electrification. We're not just creating jobs in the Bay Area, but throughout the supply chain, we've, uh, we've reached into 41 states so far in terms of job creation. So phase two of the project is what we refer to as uh, the downtown extension or the DTX. Um, what it does is it extends from where Caltrain currently stops uh, at 4th and King into the new transit center in the heart of downtown. Uh, I think for people who aren't familiar for San Francisco, uh, aren't familiar with San Francisco, or even for San Franciscans who, if you don't write Caltrain, people don't realize how far outside of the downtown core it stops. This is about a, a mile and a half extension. Uh, this alignment that you see here uh, is environmentally cleared. It was environmentally cleared uh, in 2004. There have been some uh, minor modifications since 2004, primarily related to um, uh, requirements of the California High Speed Rail Authority. So we're currently in the process of doing a supplemental environmental clearance and hope to have that completed uh, within the next few months. Uh, here you see uh, something that I wanted to mention because it's a big topic of discussion in San Francisco. The city is doing a study to uh, determine, to confirm uh, whether or not the alignment uh, that's been environmentally cleared uh, is gonna be the best one for the future needs of the, of the city. So this is a very complicated slide, but what it, what it shows in a nutshell is that there are um, uh, two main options being looked at, one of which is compatible with the existing alignment and one of which would, would change the existing alignment. And it's, it all relates to the trains that come in from the south, uh, south of um, the alignment for the DTX, Caltrain, high-speed rail, right now those are at grade, and the city has a very strong interest in finding ways to bring those trains in uh, through a tunnel uh, underground. That has to do with safety, congestion, so forth. Um, it also uh, has to do, from a planning perspective, with uh, the way having those tracks at grade would divide uh, two fast-growing neighborhoods in San Francisco, the, the Soma, South of Market neighborhood, and the Mission Bay neighborhood. So here you see another uh, illustration of the alignment. This also shows the connectivity issue that we uh, have been trying to solve for. Um, you see where the existing Caltrain station is located and how far that is from the downtown core, from the financial district. Um, this is important for Caltrain's future ridership. Um, Caltrain is booming right now, but we're trying to build a station that plans for the next 100 years. But it's also especially important for um, 
for high-speed rail because uh, our thinking and the city's thinking is when people are coming all the way from Los Angeles, San Diego, um, they don't want to end up a mile and a half from their destination, especially if they have luggage and so forth. Um, the other thing that this, uh, that this aerial view illustrates is uh, one of the, the things that uh, was the impetus for this project that's, that spurred that 1999 vote. Uh, the city back then recognized that the downtown core, the financial district north of Market, was essentially built out. There wasn't a lot of room to grow. So the city wanted to catalyze development south of Market, kind of shift the skyline southward so that downtown San Francisco would be able to accommodate future economic growth. And here you see uh, a very old uh, uh, picture of the old Transbay Terminal. And you see that wall of buildings that kind of ends uh, at uh, Market Street. And south of Market, there's, uh, there's very little. It's a lot of uh, parking lots. Now, if you walk uh, into downtown San Francisco, you will see uh, many new buildings and, and a lot of construction. In a few years, once everything that's currently underway is completed, uh, this is how the new neighborhood is, um, is going to look. And in addition to achieving that goal that the city had of catalyzing development uh, south of market, it's also a big part of how we've been able to generate revenues uh, to construct the project. And that story goes back to the um, earthquake that happened in 1989. Back then, part of the uh, Embarcadero Freeway collapsed. And eventually, the city tore down that freeway. And it opened up this land in the area uh, around the transit center. And you see it here, that area is outlined in, uh, in blue. The state in 2003 agreed to transfer that land over to our project. So it's about 12 acres of land that we've been able to sell. It's land in downtown San Francisco, so it's valuable real estate. The revenues from those land sales uh, go towards construction of the project. Uh, we also were able to work with the city uh, to create something called the Transbay Redevelopment Area in 2005. That created uh, tax increment financing, similar to what was referred to earlier for uh, CTA in Chicago. The, the Transbay Redevelopment Area specifies that our project gets a portion of the property tax revenue from what is developed on those 12 acres of land. And that property tax revenue is um, designated to the project for a 45-year period from 2005 to 2050. So it's a, a major funding source to complete phase one, but also uh, for phase two as well. The other thing that happened in this area surrounding the transit center, we worked with the city to create something uh, in 2012 called the Transit Center District Plan Area. Here you see it outlined in red. Uh, what the city did is they essentially offered developers in that area the opportunity to upzone. Uh, upzone means building taller buildings. Taller buildings are um, worth a lot more money because it's more leasable space. Uh, for example, one of the towers that I mentioned earlier, Salesforce Tower, um, it's going to be the largest building or the tallest building uh, west of uh, Chicago uh, for, for a few minutes. There's a building here in LA that's underway that I think is a few months behind that's eventually going to be taller. But it was originally zoned for uh, 550 feet. And because of the Transit Center District Plan, that building is actually going to be 1,070 feet. So you can get a sense of how much more leasable space that is. The city said to developers, if you proactively choose to upzone, you have to acknowledge that you're, building, or you're bringing more uh, people into a dense urban area. And so we need infrastructure to support those people. So for the developers that proactively chose to upzone, they had to agree to participate in a special tax district. And in California, those are referred to as a Melorus Community Facilities District. So after the Transit Center District Plan was enacted in 2012, we spent the next two and a half years working with the city to form this special tax district. That was completed in January of 2015, and 82.6% of the revenues from that special tax district are designated for this project. So similar to the tax increment, some of that will go towards uh, completing phase one, uh, and then the majority of it will go towards phase two. So here you see a, a, a summary of some of the ways that the um, private sector development around the transit center that the project has catalyzed um, has 
been able to produce revenues that go towards construction. We've been able to extract revenues from that private sector development. The one thing on this list I haven't mentioned yet is uh, something that was also formed in 2015 called a community benefit district. Uh, we have several of these in San Francisco. I'm actually not familiar with um, whether this type of, sometimes they're uh, referred to as business improvement districts, um, but it's essentially like a neighborhood-wide homeowners association. Uh, in the neighborhood surrounding the transit center, we had to work with all the property owners, residential and commercial, to get them to agree to place this assessment on themselves. And uh, the assessments go towards a number of things in the neighborhood that relate to security and parks. Uh, but for this project, uh, it uh, goes towards operations and maintenance on the reef rooftop park. And the way the CBD is, is set up, uh, at the beginning of the process, there's something called an engineer's report, where it's determined the balance between the special benefits specific to the surrounding neighborhood and the general benefit to the city uh, and community at large. So that engineer's report determined that there was uh, about 80% specific benefit, special benefit to the surrounding neighborhood. So the CBD will uh, contribute 80% towards O&M costs for the rooftop park. And uh, here you see uh, uh, the, the, the key number here is in the lower right hand corner. This is our current cost estimate for phase two. Uh, we did a cost review with our regional transportation authority, which is called MTC, uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, uh, back in the fall of 2015, used that information to produce this uh, current estimate of 3.93 billion. And here you see what we have in our funding plan so far. Um, everything above the blue box are the funds that have already been committed. Uh, it's uh, a mix of um, the things I've already talked about, the property tax increment, the Melarus Special Tax District, um, and also some uh, uh, local sales tax um, and some bridge toll money. Everything in the blue box is what is being committed in what's referred to as Plan Bay Area. That's our regional transportation uh, plan in Northern California. It gets updated every four years. Uh, we're currently in the process of, of approving the 2017 update, uh, but these are the numbers from the final preferred scenario that uh, our regional transportation authority voted on uh, a few months ago. Everything below the blue box is um, what is what is yet to, to be committed. Uh, it includes one more parcel that we're going to sell as part of phase two, and it's because right now we have a temporary facility, which is uh, uh, covering all of the bus operations for the region. Um, we can't shut that down and sell that land until we open phase one and bus operations move over to phase one. And then the, the last row is a concept that actually goes all the way back to our original environmental clearance in 2004, this concept of doing a passenger facility charge, a small surcharge on uh, tickets for Caltrain rides or high-speed rail rides that end at the transit center. You would only pay it if, um, if your trip ends at the transit center. So in the context of high-speed rail, right now, if you fly from LA to San Francisco, you're already paying a $4.50 passenger facility charge, and you actually end up at the airport, if you take BART into the city, it's another $9. So the total cost to get downtown is um, over $13. We're looking at numbers that would, be, that would be much less than that, but the idea being that we wanna be able to make the argument to the Caltrain board and to the High Speed Rail Authority board that we're not increasing anyone's out-of-pocket costs. Uh, here is our uh, current delivery schedule that we've proposed to our board. Again, a lot of information on this slide, but the key point is the last line that shows uh, once we've lined up all of our funding, we've got about a seven year construction period, and we are looking at different delivery methods that might uh, potentially reduce that time a little bit, but what this would, um, do is it would bring trains uh, into downtown San Francisco by 2026, which aligns with the current High Speed Rail Authority business plan uh, in terms of when they believe is the soonest they could have um, uh, trains, high speed rail trains uh, into San Francisco. And then finally, I'll just end with a, a point that we uh, certainly like to make clear uh, to policymakers uh, when we're meeting with them. Um, and this also goes back to that cost review that our Regional Transportation Authority did uh, back in 2015. They recommended that we use a 5% escalation figure, and when you're talking about nearly $4 billion, those numbers add up quite quickly. So we believe there's uh, some urgency associated with um, getting those funds lined up. And 
we'll do questions after. Thank you so much. Thank you.